Welcome to the Q&A session. You have to ask the questions and I will attempt to give the answers. So I'll try to do a rolling queue, which means that everyone who hasn't asked a question gets priority over those who have. Okay, so I try to do this. So, I, okay, you've got a question. I have all of the finals that were on the website and I indexed them by the uh, fall or spring in the year. Fall 2006, number two. Yes, I, I expect that, uh, that I think three of them, including this fall 2006, uh, don't have any solutions. So I expect to see uh, more problems from there. But of course, some of the solutions that were provided weren't particularly clear. So we'll probably be going over some of that as well. Anyway, I think the question is, let A be a three by three matrix. Okay, so is it part A? Or, part A and part B are completely different. So if there's one in particular that you wanted me to look at, or both? Both. Both, okay. So this is 406. Question two, two, A. Well, question two. So A says, A is 3 by 3, and you are given that A squared equals 2A. And the question is, what could debt A be? What are the possibilities? List the possibilities and give an example in each case. Give an example in each case. All right, so if we have a squared equals 2a, since I, I try to get the person who asked the question to help me out a little bit, what are you interested in? The determinant of a. Okay, so here you have an equation, a squared equals 2a. What should you do first? Well, okay, you could, you, you want to, here's an equation, it doesn't involve a determinant. So how are you going to get an inter, a determinant involved? Yeah, let's take the determinant of both sides of the equation. If I take that, and I say, okay, well, a squared equals 2a. I mean, it doesn't tell me that much about a. Let's just take the determinant of both sides. You get the determinant of a squared equals the determinant of 2a. Now, of course, what you're really interested in is the determinant of a. So you'd like to boil this down to the determinant of a somehow on both sides. So how do, what is the determinant of a squared? How do you simplify that? all squared. Okay, so here I'm going to change this to the determinant of a all squared. That's one of the rules that I gave is that the determinant of a to the n is the nth power of the determinant of a. What if you multiply by a inverse? How do you know a is invertible? But I will concede that you could say either the determinant of a is zero or you could multiply by a inverse and that we'll explore that possibility in a second. Um, okay, Suppose we do this. Fine, that's the left-hand side. Can you also tell me what is the determinant of 2a? Six times the determinant of a. Where do you get the six from? Yes, it's 2 to the 3. But that's not the same as 6. That's 8. So 2 to the 3 determinant of a. Yes, be careful. If you multiply one of the rows or, say, or the columns if you prefer, if you multiply one of the rows by 2, then the determinant gets multiplied by 2. When we are multiplying every row by 2, then every row gives a factor of 2 in the determinant calculation. And because it's 3 by 3, that's where we use the 3 by 3. Okay, so anyway, this says that this determinant squared equals 8 times the determinant. So either, this is now a very simple computation, either debt A equals 8 or debt A is equal to 0. Okay, so those are the only two possibilities of, see, if determinant of A is 0, then fine. If it's not, you can divide by it and you get debt A is 2 cubed, which is 8. All right, so that's the first little issue. Then the second issue is now we have to find two matrices, one for determinant 8 and one for determinant 0. Okay, what is the easiest matrix to deal with out of all possible matrices? What, uh, what is the easiest one? 
a diagonal or well zero is the easiest but it's it's that's going to help in this case maybe but in general uh, even a multiple of the identity might be the best shot or a diagonal one so i don't know i mean what's a simple diagonal matrix that might give us a determinant of 8 what about 2 2 2 does that work so if a equals this certainly certainly it's uh, determinant is 8. We need to check that a squared is 2a. Well, a squared is just 4, 4, 4 on the diagonal, which is definitely 2a. And of course here, a equals 0 will work. The 0 matrix, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. It has determinant 0, and its square is 2 times it. So that would be my gut feeling as to the easiest thing would be to take a diagonal one. And if you think about it, actually the eigenvalues pretty much have to be 2 or 0 for that to be true, at least if it's symmetric. So if it's diagonal in particular, it has to be 2, 2, 2 or 0, 0, 0. <laughs> now, we had an alternative suggestion uh, of how to proceed. This is an alternative solution, which amounts to much the same thing. But if you have a squared equals 2a, then either a is non-invertible, in which case the determinant of A equals 0. And we have an example of the 0 matrix that will satisfy this equation. So this is not an empty case. Or debt A is not 0, so A is invertible. If the determinant of A is non-zero, then A is invertible. So you can take this equation and multiply it on the left or right, for that matter, by A inverse, if that exists. And you get A equals 2 times the identity. So in fact, this shows that if the determinant of A is not 0, then A must be this. This is the only possible example that you can give. And of course, then debt A is obviously 8 which is the other possibility. So the alternative approach says, look, either of the determinants zero, and we have an example of this, um, the, the obvious example of the zero matrix, or you can actually multiply by the inverse, in which case you know what A is. Not just the determinant, but you know this is the only example of a matrix that satisfies this equation and that has determinant non-zero. OK, any questions about part A of the problem? All right, let's do part B. B says, let A equal the 2 by 2 matrix A, B, C, D, and B be also a 2 by 2 matrix A minus C, A minus uh, B minus D, A plus C, B plus D. And it says, you know, you don't know what these variables are, but it is given that debt B equals 2. And the question is, what is debt A? So it's another sort of knowing one determinant, find a different one. All right, well, there's a brute force approach which says this, determinant of B. So this is method one, which is the realistic one, for reasons I'll show you, although far less snazzy than method two. Determinant of B is my A minus B plus D plus D minus a plus c, b minus d. And if you expand this out, you get a, b minus b, c plus a, d minus c, d minus a, b plus a, d minus a, b <sighs> minus b, c. OK. How fun was that? Not. And I probably made a mistake, too. Uh, did I say plus c, d? No, I didn't. I put an extra a, b there, plus c, d. OK, so uh, what have we got? We've got this A, B cancels out. We have C, D cancels out. And you have two lots of A, D minus two lots of B, C. And funnily enough, that's twice the determinant of A. And the determinant of B was 2 given by the question. 
So the algebra says 2 equals 2 debt A, so debt A equals 1. Okay, any questions about that method? That's just the brute force method. If you're wondering why no, I took method two, uh, could be kind of cute. I don't know. I wouldn't advise this, but I thought of it when I was solving the problem because it seemed to me unsatisfactory. I mean, I've seen this sort of thing before, but it seemed to me unsatisfactory to just have this algebra working out without really understanding it. Uh, and so here's what I did. We know that you're allowed to add one multiple of one row to another. So we could start with debt A is the determinant of this matrix A, B, C, D. And if we say add the first row to the second, then the determinant is not changed. Remember, this is the, the Gauss-Jordan method. So I'm just going to add the first row to the second. Adding a multiple of one row to another does not change the determinant. All right. Now I'm going to multiply the second row by a half. So the determinant of this matrix is half as what it was before. I'm going to need two here to fix that up. So the two can go into any one row and multiply both of them. If I wanted to double both the rows, I'd need a four. So this is still correct. And now, what I want to do is I want to subtract this new row from this row. That doesn't change the determinant either. And if you take a minus a plus c over 2, you actually get a minus c over 2. And here you get b minus d over 2. Pretty funky. Now I want to pull out the factor of a half from this row and a half from this row. And so this will give us 2 times a half times a half times the determinant of a minus c, b minus d a plus c, b plus d, which is actually the determinant of b, which is 2. So again, you get the answer 1. OK, so clearly I, I'm being a little clever here uh, in a way. I mean, what I've done is I've transformed a into b by means of ele elementary row operations. So, but you know, you certainly don't need to do that. And you could argue that the first method is preferable on an exam because A, you would think of it quickly, it's the obvious thing to do, and B, it only takes a couple of seconds as opposed to the other one, which took a while. But still, it's nice to see why it's true. I think it's a better understanding in the second case. OK, so any questions about part B or the methodology or anything like that? All right, so who's next? OK, did you raise a hand? No, so we'll go up the back here. Spring 2007, question 6. That's the one with A and B being two matrices, two three by three matrices. OK, so it says, so it says, let A be 1, 0, 1. 0, 2, 0, 1, 0, 1. And let B be 2, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0. OK, show A and B as similar. Well, it's sort of difficult to show two matrices as similar. It's much easier to show that two matrices are not similar, if indeed they are not similar. If, if they are similar, it's very, very difficult, in fact, impossible to show that they are not similar, because I just told you they were. So 
The, why is it easy if I gave you two matrices and said to you, show that they are not similar? Why is that easier? Because all you have to do is find some way that they differ. They might have a different trace. They might have a different, a different determinant. They might have different eigenvalues or different multiplicities of eigenvalues, different characteristic polynomial, that sort of stuff. So, however, to show that two matrices are similar, it's not enough to check all this. You can't just say, oh, look, the trace is four. The determinant is, is zero, which you could compute. It's it's not, not a, you actually need to show how one changes into the other. But luckily in this case, one of these matrices is already diagonal. So B is automatically diagonalizable because it's diagonal. There's nothing to do. It's already in diagonal form. So to show A is similar to B, you, you just have to diagonalize A. Okay, if B were a little trickier than that, one thing you can hope for in this course, and you might want to write this down, very often when you have to show that two matrices are similar, especially more than two by two, if it's three by three or higher, very often the technique is to show that they are both similar to the same diagonal matrix by diagonalizing them both. So that's a good technique to show that two matrices are similar. If you can diagonalize them both and get the same answer, and remember, you can write the eigenvalues in whatever order you like. So instead of 2, 2, 0, if you had 0, 2, 2, well, you, write, you change the order into 2, 2, 0. That's fine. So what I'm trying to say is if you can show that they're both similar to the same diagonal matrix, then they're similar to each other automatically. If A is similar to D, diagonal, and D is similar to B, then A is similar to B. It's a transitive relation. I did mention this in the main course, uh, in the main course review, rather. In any case, what we need to do is uh, diagonalize A. So do you know that you can diagonalize A, by the way, without even looking at it? It's sort of hard in general, but why would you have confidence that A is diagonalizable? It's symmetric, so you have this spectral theorem. So automatically, A must be diagonalizable. Let's compute the determinant of A minus lambda I. So that's the determinant of 1 minus lambda, 0, 1, 0, 2 minus lambda, 0, 1, 0, 1. And you can do this a number of ways. The snazzy sort of way is to go in the middle row, because that's got lots of zeros. And if you think of the checkerboard, plus, minus, uh, minus, plus. So it's actually 2 minus lambda, the middle term, times the determinant of this submatrix, which is 1 minus lambda times 1 minus 1 times 1. And if you work this out, you get, uh, sorry, I left out a, mi a, a minus lambda. There we go. 1 minus lambda squared minus 1. Thank you. So let's see what that works out to be. 2 minus lambda. This will work out to be lambda squared minus 2 lambda plus 1 minus 1. And the long and the short of it is you should get minus lambda, lambda minus 2 squared. We pick up a lambda minus 2 from this. I flipped it around with the minus sign here. And you get another lambda minus 2 there. So actually, it doesn't matter if you put the plus or minus there. I mean, technically, it would be wrong if without the minus. But you know, you only care when this equals 0. So when lambda equals 0 or 2. OK, so there's two eigenvalues, 0 and 2. The algebraic multiplicity of this is 1. Alg mult 1. And the algebraic multiplicity of this is 2 because of the square here. So if you didn't know A was symmetric and you just did this computation, what could you conclude right now? Do you know whether A is diagonalizable? No. The problem being that 2, the eigenvalue 2, may only have a geometric multiplicity of 1. 0 has a geometric multiplicity of 1, because it's an eigenvalue. 
but two need only have a geometric multiplicity of one, in which case you'd be screwed because they wouldn't even be diagonalizable. So the fact is, if you don't want to actually find the eigenspace, and why waste time if you, if you don't have to, then here's what I would say. I would say, since A is symmetric, it's diagonalizable. and quote the spectral theorem. So geometric multiplicity equals algebraic multiplicity. And therefore, A equals S, D, S inverse, where D equals 2, 2, 0. But that's just B. That's exactly B. D is the same as B, i.e. A is similar to B. All right. Again, if you don't quote the spectral theorem, then you actually have to find the eigenspace for lambda equals 2. It's not necessary for lambda equals 0, because you already know that's a one-dimensional eigenspace. So, but you'd have to show that the kernel of a minus 2i is two-dimensional by actually computing it. And then you'd be at, entitled to use the same thing. So what I'm trying to say is the alternative to the spectral theorem would be compute kernel of a minus 2i, which just for completeness as an alternative solution is the kernel of minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 0, minus 1. And the bottom row is just a multiple of the top one. So that's the same as the kernel of minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 which is the span, we have essentially two free variables, the second and the third. So it could just be 0, 1, 0, or it could be 1, 0, 1. Those are clearly both in the kernel, and they're independent. So this shows that, that the eigenspace for 2 is two-dimensional, and automatically E0 is one dimensional. So we've got all the dimensions that we need. And it establishes that A equals S DS inverse as before. So if A were not symmetric, or if you didn't feel like using the spectral theorem, you would just have to check that. Again, don't bother checking the eigenspace for 0. It's going to be one dimensional. The algebraic multiplicity is 1. That always gives a one dimensional eigenspace. Okay, so that either that or that spectral theorem stuff would be required. So that's part A. Any other, qu any questions about part A? I thought zero was allowed to be an eigenspace. No, zero is allowed to be an eigenvalue, and you can therefore have an eigenspace of zero, which is also the kernel of the matrix itself. What you might be confusing this with is that zero is not allowed to be an eigenvector. Zero can be an eigenvalue. But v equals 0 is not an eigenvector, because if it were, its eigenvalue would be any number. So 0 is definitely an allowed eigenvalue, and its eigenspace is the kernel of the matrix itself. Think of cur a minus lambda i. If lambda is 0, that's just cur a. a v equals 0 v. So a v equals 0. Yeah, remember that. So I've seen questions on quizzes and, and, and previous finals that ask about eigen, does this thing have an eigenvalue of zero? zero? It's a trick for, does, is the kernel not something, you know, is the kernel of the matrix non-trivial? Is the nullity bigger than zero? That sort of question. Okay, so eigenvalue of zero, yes. Eigenspace for lambda equals zero, yes. Eigenvector equals zero, no. Okay, any other questions about part A? I'm uh, do you want me to do B and, and C as well as part of it? Okay. They seem sort of 
actually they, they relate, so they continue on. So B says, suppose that C is 3 by 2 and D is 2 by 3. And you're given that CD equals B, where B is that same matrix from the right board there, the diagonal matrix. It says, show that DC is the diagonal matrix 2, 2, 2, 0, 0, 2. Well, this has a solution that involves block matrices. And I feel a little uncomfortable presenting it in a way because we didn't really do block or partitioned matrices. Okay, did everyone here do partition matrices in class? Or if you prefer, did anyone here not do partition matrices in class? See, I, I suspect that, that we made a decision not to, not to do it. So um, I feel like it's a bit of an unfair question as it turns out from that point of view. By the way, let, let me just recast the, the solution which does use these, part, these blocks um, comes down to this. So suppose instead I asked you the following question. B is no longer this previous matrix. It's just 2, 2. It's a 2 by 2 matrix looking like that. So I've gotten rid of that third area. And let's suppose C and D are both 2 by 2 matrices instead of th two, 3 by 2. So I've gotten rid of the third dimension. Could you now do the problem? So here's the problem. B is 2, 0, 0, 2. C is 2 by 2. D, D, D is 2 by 2. two. And the question is, to show that if CD equals B, then DC equals that matrix there. How would you do that? Any ideas? What's special about B? It's not just diagonal. It's twice the identity. So this says CD is twice the identity, or if you prefer a half CD is the identity. And you know that if CD equals the identity, then C and D are inverses of each other. And therefore, DC is also twice the identity. So all this question actually is, is keeping track of the zero entry there as well. But I, I think I'm going to skip it over because it's not, it's not fair game for this. So uh, although they did it only a year ago, it's, it's apparently not in the course. But we, we may as well do part C, which I think is fair game, even if part B is not. So C, assuming part B the You don't know what C and D are. Yeah, I mean C and D are just any two matrices which are inverse of each other with the factor of two in there, are uh, adjoined with zeros around. You could put 2 into C, or you could put 2 into D, or you could put root 2 into both of them. It's, you know, 2 times the other. Almost. Almost. No, obviously not, because you get twice the identity. Yeah, so right. Yeah, with 2 times the identity. OK, anyway, part C says, assuming part B, says, okay, now says if CD equals A, show DC equals B, which is, well, not B, 2, 0, 0, 2. Okay, so the first part says if CD equals B, this matrix which is diagonal, then DC is twice the identity. The second part says, actually, if CD is even equal to A, show that DC is twice the identity. And you can do this by assuming the result of part B. And here's what they want you to do. Here's what they want you to do. They want you to say, well, A is similar to B. So we have CD 
is A, which is S, B, S inverse. All right? So now what we need to do is get the S stuff on the other side. So we can isolate B. So we multiply on the left by S inverse and on the right by S. So we now know that S inverse C, D, S equals B. Okay, so what? I mean, what does this give us? Well, the previous part, which we skipped admittedly, but the previous part says that if you have two matrices, 3 by 2 and 2 by 3, that multiply to B, then if you reverse the order, they multiply to this other matrix. Now, here we have two matrices that multiply by B. The way you see that is by grouping them like this. S inverse C, which by the way will be 3 by 2, and DS is 2 by 3. After all, S and S inverse are both 3 by 3. So this makes sense. All right, so here are two matrices, bunk and bunk. Okay, I should call them different things. Bunk and blibble. Okay, blunk times blibble equals B. Well, according to this, if blunk times blibble equals B, then this means that blibble times blunk equals 2002. So here's blibble. So by part B, blibble, which is DS, times blunk, which is S inverse C, is equal to 2002. And beautifully, the S and the S inverse cancel, and there's our result. Magic. OK, so that was a pretty tricky question. Even, even assuming part B, part C was pretty tricky. Do you have a question about this? Or? How do you know that CD equals B? It's still a condition Well, in part C, CD is not equal to B. In part C, CD is equal to A. I never said here that CD was equal to B. I said blunk times blibble was equal to, 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 a, to, to B. They are different matrices that multiply to B. And when I reversed them, I was careful to reverse the blink and the blibble and not the C and the D. It might have been clearer if they had used different letters than C and D. If they had instead said E and F, then you could have said, here is S inverse E. I'm going to call that C instead of blunk. And here is ds, that's actually fs, I'm going to call that d, and then use part, part b of the question. But they decided to use the same letters again to make life more difficult and force me to make up stupid words like blunk and blibble. Any other questions about part c? Yeah. Uh, how about we should assume that a and b are the same? Oh, I'm using part a of the question. I mean, this is continued from the part on the board there. It's, it's very much clear when you read the question that these are the same matrices. Otherwise, you're screwed. <laughs> Another question about this? <laughs> well, I didn't actually switch them. Notice that Blanc times Blibble is B, but Blibble times Blanc is, is uh, this other matrix, 2002. The way I switched them is by part B of the question, which said that if I, I don't think of this as C and D. I think of this as blunk times blibble. If, so, if, if something times something is B, and then you reverse the order, you get this, this two, two I there. By the way, notice that this is a 3 by 3 matrix, 2, 2, 0. But this is only a 2 by 2 matrix, 2, 0, 0, 2. So it cannot be. The dimensions have to be respected. Any other questions about this? Again, part B, I, it's not too bad, but I mean, without the partitioned matrices theory, sort of unfair. And some people did it in class, but not everyone. So we, we decided not to examine it. I didn't cover it in my reviews for that reason. Uh, QR, I think, is, is fair game, yeah. Why? Well, it was excluded from the midterm because people didn't cover it in time, but I think that it should have been covered in class eventually.
I haven't seen a lot of questions, but I, I think it's fair game for this. General question or? Yeah, it's about part A. Could part you, A. Could you have uh, that first matrix just done uh, Jeff's Jordan and I and seen that it had one, one, zero on the diagonal? That Gauss Jordan doesn't tell you, uh, it doesn't preserve kernels, or I mean, it preserves kernels, it doesn't preserve eigenspaces, so. It doesn't tell you that it's like multiple of the. No, 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 I don't think so. It's, it's not the right tool for this. It's tempting and it's much easier, but it's, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe it. Okay, any other questions about this problem? Okay, so you have other questions, I can tell, but you've already asked one, so you've got to wait a little bit. So I have one and then two, okay? Go ahead. Spring 06, number four. Oh, that uh, four by four matrix with the determinant? Okay, here goes. It says, you want to consider this is a matrix, A, B, C, D, minus B, A, minus D, C, minus C, D, A, minus B, minus D, C, uh, minus C, rather, B, A. Who knows where these things get thought of? Uh, it says compute, so consider the determinant of this. And actually what you want to do is take the absolute value of the determinant. So those big ass absolute value bars that are there are actually just that. It's, it's sort of weird, but that, those are absolute values there. The question is to show that no matter what A, B, and C, and D are, this is a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared all squared. And it seems a little bizarre. It's actually a skew symmetric matrix as it turns out except for the diagonal. The diagonal of a skew symmetric matrix has to be zero but otherwise these things reflect. I mean this sort of matrix looks like it's completely random and whacked but it actually has some significance uh, if you start doing sort of more generalized complex numbers. So it does show up in sort of quaternion type of things. In any case, that's really not the point. The, the point is there is a hint. There is a hint. First, compute the matrix of the, the product of the transpose with itself. So it says first compute a transpose A, where A is the 4 by 4 matrix. This is from spring 06. Spring 06, question 4. It says, hint, first compute A transpose A. Well, if they give you a hint, it's probably a good idea to take it. So let's transpose the down thing. To do that, I'm going to write the first column as the first row. The second column becomes the second row. And finally, the, the last row, the last column. Okay. And then we write out this, the original matrix again. And we have to multiply this mess out. So this is A transpose A. All right, the first entry is definitely a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. No question about that. Now, you have to look at the other entries. And in each case, you will find that you get 0 along the first row. You just have to look at it. You say a, b minus a, b minus c, d plus c, d. OK, that's 0. a, c, there's a minus a, c. There's a b, d. There's a minus b, d. AD, 
AD, they cancel, minus BC, plus BC. I don't know if you're able to film that, but okay, good. All right, well, if you keep on going, you find that you get A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared. A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared. A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared. On all the diagonals and everything else is zero. All right, so that's the hint. We still haven't found the determinant. But we want the determinant of A. Actually, we want the absolute value. So you take the determinant of A transpose A is equal to, it's a diagonal matrix. So it's just this times this times this times this, which is the fourth power of A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared. But this is equal to the determinant of A transpose times the determinant of A. Now beware. A lot of the time we have seen det A transpose A, and this equation that I've written is wrong. That is because A is not a square. square. In which case, this makes sense, because A transpose A is always square. But A may not be square. In this case, A is square. So actually, the determinant of A transpose is also the determinant of A. In other words, this is the determinant of A squared. So you know the determinant of A squared is this to the fourth power. I left out the fourth power there. And now I just take square roots. So the absolute value of determinant of A equals A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared, all squared. The square root of the fourth power is the square. And you need the absolute values because the determinant of A might be negative. If you know something squared is something, it doesn't tell you what it is. It's only the plus or minus. You have a question about this? What are the conditions to have the determinant of A equal A transpose? So here's the deal. If A is square, then the determinant of A transpose equals the determinant of A. And in particular, that leads to the determinant of A transpose A is the determinant of A all squared. That's true. If A determinants only defined for a square matrix. OK, so this is a whimsical little question. Um, without the hint, it would be really annoying. With the hint, it's somewhat less annoying. And as I said, it, it does actually come up. It, it's not a coincidence that they wrote this matrix down, although it's sort of not obvious where they got it from. All right, any other questions about that particular question? Again, follow the hint. OK, so. You have a different question, but I am committed to going up the back first. But you can be next after that. Um, could you go over the question five on the bulk of this? Bless you. So we're talking two uh, a, a, a differential equations? Yes. Four, 2005. Six. Yes. So it's a 2D system of differential equations. Uh, I'm going to need more space than I can really afford over there, so. OK, here goes. Fall 2006, question 5. It says you're given y1 prime is equal to minus y1 plus 4y2. 
and y2 prime equals minus 2y1 minus 5y2 and you're given that y1 of 0 y2 of 0 is minus 1 1 okay so this says that actually if you pack this up into a vector type of equation you have dy dt is a y where a is the matrix of coefficients of this minus 1, 4, minus 2, minus 5. And what's more, it also says that y of 0 as a vector is minus 1, 1. I should probably put this vectors over y's here just to distinguish between the y1, y2. All right, so that's the first task, is to convert this into a matrix type of thing. So you, ne you need to find a matrix. But then I have to say, everything proceeds as exactly as I did last time, which is the standard methodology. So any problem of this sort, there's a standard methodology that breaks into two possible cases depending on what the eigenvalues are. Okay, so again, th this is, I'm going to do it, it's a f fine, fair question, but this is a sort of learn the method and work the problem type of thing. So I think of it as easy points if you've done practice in some sort of method. Okay, so here is what, here's the method. So the first thing to do is to diagonalize A, if you can. So you take det A minus lambda I, which is just the determinant of this two by two matrix, minus one minus lambda, four minus two minus five minus lambda, which is minus 1 minus lambda, minus 5 minus lambda, minus, minus 2 times 4, which works out to be the quadratic lambda squared plus 6 lambda plus 13. My favorite way of solving this is either to factor it or to try to complete the square. I, I think of this as lambda plus 3 all squared. There's 9. I have an extra 4. So I say this equals 0 when lambda is minus 3 plus or minus 2i. 2i is the square root of minus 4. And I got the minus lambda equals minus 3, the real part, from here. But if you don't like it, then use the quadratic formula on the original one to find those solutions there. Now, normally you'd like the eigenvalues all to be real. But in the two by two case, we have this special Euler method for solving it when there are two eigenvalues which are complex. And the technique is to take the one with the plus here and find the eigenvector. So take lambda is minus three plus two i, and we want to find the eigenvector or eigenspace. So we take the kernel of a minus lambda i, and we're going to have to deal with a little complex arithmetic. So this is the kernel of. You take the original matrix and subtract minus 3 plus 2i from each of the diagonals. So if you prefer in this matrix, I'm going to replace lambda by minus 3 plus 2i. So we'll actually get 2 minus 2i here. We'll get 4. We'll get minus 2. And here you get minus 2 minus 2i. All right. Unless we made a big mistake, this column, this row rather, should be a multiple of this one. Not obvious why. Well, if it's not, then the kernel is zero. And so we made a mistake up here. It could be. Where should it be 8 minus 2i? You mean this one here? No, minus 5, minus, yeah. Yeah, it's a minus 5 there. OK, so what I'm saying is if you have a kernel of a 2 by 2 matrix that you think is not trivial, then you actually only need the first row. You only need the first row. So I'm going to claim without much proof that this is going to reduce to the kernel of the first row with zeros down here. But we'll do a reality check later and make sure. I'm also going to divide the first row by 2. And then to find such a kernel, the easiest thing to do 
is to write this as the span. I switch the entries around and stick a minus in front. So I'm just going to go with minus 2, 1 minus i. OK, let's do a reality check here. First of all, why does this one work with this? Well, you get minus 2 lots of 1 minus i plus 2 lots of 1 minus i. So a very good technique to find a kernel of a 2 by 2 matrix just based on the top row is to flip the entries and stick a, one in a minus in front of one of them. And you will get the correct thing. Let's just check that the bottom one works. Just a reality check. Minus 2, you want minus 2, minus 2, minus 2i dot, minus 2, 1 minus i. That would be the bottom row. Surely that's got to be 0. You get 4 minus 2 plus 2i times 1 minus i. 2, 2i times i is minus 2. So this is, but because of the minus, we have a plus. And then 2i minus 2i. Yep, it worked. So I sort of cheated. I assumed that this bottom row, if you did the Gauss-Jordan elimination, would go down to 0, 0. But again, it has to. If this is an eigenvalue, actually, then it has to. All right, so I found that an eigenvalue, an eigenvector, v plus w i, or v plus i w, is take the real part of this, minus 2, 1, plus i times the imaginary part, 0, minus 1. Okay, So I feel like this is the most difficult part of the thing, to deal with these complex numbers and the kernel. But again, my technique is, unless I made a computation error, just ignore the second row, just write them as zeros and worry about it later or not at all. And then just uh, flip, the, flip the first two in the top row and stick a minus in front of one of them. Then you have to separate this out into the minus 2, 1, and the 0i minus 1i, and get this. OK, so once you've done that, you've done all the hard work, and all you pretty much have to do is write out the solution and do a bit of matrix multiplication. And so we're going to whip out the formula that I urged you to memorize and do so once again. Please memorize this formula. It's by far the easiest way to handle this in an exam situation is that the solution, which in this case is y of t, is equal to, it's always equal to s, and then, well, actually, there's an e to the pt out the front. s cosine qt minus sine qt sine qt cosine qt. So this is a rotation matrix in the familiar form. S inverse times the, the initial value, which is y0, where first of all, S is Wv, which in this case, we have to come back over here. This is the W, the imaginary part, and that's the v. So w is 0 minus 1, and v is minus 2, 1. Also, we need to know what p plus q is. So the lambda is p plus q, which in our case was minus 3 plus 2i. So p is minus 3, q is 2. And now all we have to do is substitute. You have a question so far? There are different ways of expressing this span. Okay. And so there's not a unique choice of V and W by any means. So if you did this problem, 
and you wrote down it in a different form, but still got, you should still get the same answer. And it's possible that you could have an easier version. This is the one I happen to oops, write down, not being able to predict what was the easiest computation. Sound still on? OK, good. So anyway, let's, let's wheel through this and see what we get. So first of all, p is minus 3. So we're going to have a factor of e to the minus 3t outside the whole thing. S is this matrix, 0, minus 2, minus 1, 1. Q is 2, so you get cosine 2t, minus sine 2t, sine 2t, cosine 2t. S inverse is fairly straightforward. You have to just take the determinant of S, which is minus 2, and you halve it, so times minus a half, and then you reverse the diagonal elements and stick m minus signs outside the non-diagonal elements. So that's going to be the inverse of s. And then finally, you need to multiply by y0, which is minus 1, 1 from the question. And all we have to do is compute this. So first of all, I'm going to pull the minus a half e to the minus 3t out. And rather than do the matrix multiplication, you've got to do the matrix vector stuff on the right first. So we'll keep this. Bit of a pain, but we'll write it out again. And if you multiply this out, I've pulled out the minus a half already. I get minus 1 plus 2 is 1. And minus 1 in this coordinate. And then you multiply this by this, and then you multiply this by this. And I believe that without too much more steps, I was able to get this down to e to the minus 3t sine 2t minus cosine 2t is the first coordinate. And the second coordinate is e to the minus 3t cosine 2t. And of course, this is y1 and this is y2. This is y1 here, and this is y2 down there. And as a reality check, we plug in t equals 0, and we see this is 1 times 0 minus 1 comma 1, and that is the initial condition. It doesn't prove it's the solution. If you want to prove it's the solution, you actually have to differentiate that and plug it into the original, which if you had enough time might be worthwhile doing to check your answer. But you will have to use the product rule a bunch, and that's a pain. So any questions about this example? Yeah. You have to multiply it all out. Yes, you have to multiply it all out. The question says, give the solution in real form. It does not say, leave your answers in terms of matrices. You have another question about this? This is the same solution for every complex problem, yeah. I mean, it's, it always works out like something like this. Yeah, any other questions about this example? No, we're all happy? Practice these things. Do you have a different question? OK, but you're first, and then you can go next. And then you can go. And then you can go. And then you. OK, sorry, one, two, three, four, five. We'll, we'll get, everyone will get a turn in the end. Spring of 06, number 7. Consider a discrete dynamic, oh, the one with the triangles and equal area and all that. Yeah, that's a nice problem, sort of tricky. OK, so even though we have a solution key, I feel like this could, be, this could be explained in a little more detail. OK, see, this is a sort of abstract dynamical system sort of question. It says, you, first of all, you have, so what is this, spring 06, question 7. So 
So you have x t plus 1. Hey, yo, please. Uh, A is 2 by 2 symmetric. And what's more, the eigenvalues are both positive. OK, so you have a trajectory of this system starting at x0, and then it goes x1, x2, and so on. And it says, so you should think of a dynamical system, a discrete dynamical system, as a set of points dancing around the plane. You start somewhere, then you get some, sent somewhere else, then you get sent somewhere else. Wherever you are, you always get a message saying, go here. So you're like, OK, now go here. Now go here. Now go here. So it might look something like this. You start here, x0. And then it says, now go here, x1. OK, now go here, x2. Now go here, x3. So what they're saying is, it says, for each pair of consecutive vectors in this trajectory, we consider triangles a, k that are de defined by the ends of, so a, k is the triangle consisting of the ends of the vector x at time k, x at time k plus 1, and the origin. So to get a picture of what's going on, what it's saying is that triangle here is being called A0. It's the triangle whose ends are x of 0, x of 1, and the origin. Then this triangle here is A1. This triangle is A2, and so on. I can't show you where A3 is because I don't know where x4 is, but hey. Let's put x4 over here, in which case, here's the triangle A3. And this would go on forever. Okay, okay. And then the question is, given that, and I'm going to put it here, lambda 1 times lambda 2 is in fact equal to 1. That's given. So show. A, K all have the same area. OK. There's a solution given, which I will go over. And then there's a real proper solution, which is much better than this. I'm not trying to diss on whoever wrote this solution. I have no idea who it, who it is. But actually, they should probably be shot for writing it here <laughs> instead of the proper solution. You know, I, again, I, I hope it's, you know, I, I'm sure they're very nice and all that. But this is not the way to do this problem. So <laughs> skip the official solution? Yeah, I'm going to skip the official solution. If anyone wants to see it, they can come to the break. Look, here's how the solution should be done. In my opinion, all right, here's the deal. Suppose you have a parallelogram, two vectors, v and w. They make a parallelogram. And then you take av and aw. Who knows where these things end up? And you take the parallelogram that they make. What's the area of the parallelogram of this parallelogram compared to the area of this parallelogram? You need to take the determinant of A times this. OK, so the new parallelogram, which is AV and AW, area of is the determinant of A, absolute value, times the area of the old, which is VW. Okay? 
Well, we're not dealing with parallelograms. We're dealing with triangles. So actually, well, how much does that change that equation? If I instead say triangle instead of parallelogram? It's still true, isn't it? I mean, also, so multiply both sides by a half. And it's also true of, for triangles. Triangle, new triangle, is the determinant of A times the old triangle. OK, so let's say we have a triangle. Let's say the first triangle. The first triangle up here is x of 0 and x of 1 are the two vectors. So I'll take some more space. OK, first triangle, or zeroth triangle, if you like. You have x of 0 of, and x of 1. And here it is, a of 0, a 0. OK, and the new triangle looks like this, x2, x1. OK. What is x1 in terms of x0? It's a times x0. But what is x2 in terms of x1? a times x1. So I want you to think of the triangle a0 as having x of 0 and x of 1, whereas the triangle A1 has A lots of x0 and A lots of x1. So it's exactly this scenario over here where one triangle becomes another. But the only interesting thing is that actually V becomes W and W becomes somewhere else, because AV equals W. So it's just like this, except that this vector is actually the same as this vector. So the two triangles adjoin one side. OK? So in fact, the area of A1 is equal to the determinant of A times the area of triangle A2. Is A2 the area of the triangle, or is it just the triangle? Yeah? called the triangle. OK, so to get from the, I'm sorry, not A1 and A2, A0 and A1. So if you know A's, ah, A1 and A0, damn it, the original triangle is A0. I hit both vectors with A, and I now get A1. And I'm saying that the new area is the determinant of A times this. Now, what is the determinant of A? OK, so the determinant of A is the product of the eigenvalues. Which is lambda 1, lambda 2, which is 1. So the area of A1 is equal to the area of A0. And now just repeat for any AK. So in the general scenario, generally, You have, at one point, you're at xk. You have xk plus 1, which is equal to axk, a times xk. And then here's your xk plus 2, which is axk plus 1. And so this is ak, this is ak plus 1, and the area of a k plus 1 is equal to the determinant of a absolute value area of a k. And this is 1. And then use induction. If the area of k equals k plus 1, then they're all equal. End of story. OK, isn't that better than the solution there? It also makes a lot more sense, I think. Right? I imagine you might have some questions about this. Anyone have any questions about this? Yes. Can you talk a bit more about um, is the 
Yeah, well, okay, so the, the official solution does use a cross product. And we know that the area of a parallelogram is the cross product. So if you take two vectors in, th in three dimensions, effectively, uh, and you take V, so V and W, and you, if you take cross product, that will give you the area of the parallelogram. Or it'll give you a vector whose length is the area of the, of the parallelogram. That's a formula that you should know, V cross W, the norm of that is equal to the area of the parallelogram. Yeah, the two dimensions, the cross product only makes sense if you put a third coordinate of zero, and then the cross product will be zero, zero, something. So you can't just say determinants of a matrix whose columns are V and W? Is that, uh, that will work too. That should work too. Well, it has to be, uh, you, you, yeah, that, that will work too, sure. Okay, but I want to say that, you know, the solution which uses cross products doesn't even work if you're in more than two dimensions. And this is not a multi, this is not a two dimensional problem. There's nothing intrinsic about it that's two dimensional. You just need to know that the determinant of the symmetric matrix is 1. It could work for any, it, A doesn't even really have to be symmetric. It just has to be diagonalizable with, with eigenvalues that multiply to 1. I could, okay, A is an n by n symmetric matrix with all positive eigenvalues, say, although that's not even necessary, whose product is 1. Then the solution there doesn't work, but my solution still works. I think. Maybe not. The expansion factor in two dimensions, well, I'd have to be a little more careful. So I take that back. Certainly in two dimensions it works. But I think the, the question of the showing two triangles or two parallelograms have the same area, it's an expansion factor problem. And the official solution gets, it, it sort of doesn't consider that. And considering we learnt it, that's why I think the solution is not as good as this. Okay, any other questions about this? All right. So who did I say was next? I'm working on honor. Okay. So. This kernel of A transpose N equal the kernel of A. That's the whole question? Yeah. Okay. So this is not a final problem per se, but it could be. It could be. Okay, so, so first of all, the actual question is prove this. Okay, and then your modified question is? Why, I guess, is the extra A there just because it's not necessarily N by N? Yes, so if A is N by N, there's a probably a different and easier approach to this. But this is true even for an M by N matrix. This is for any A. Okay, so again, not taken from an actual final, but conceivable that it's there. It's pretty unlikely, but it's not a very long proof, and I'm happy to do it. So there's one direction that I have seen asked on finals. And the one direction is this. Actually, this is, first of all, if you have something in this side, it should be very easy to show that it's in this side. So first conceptual thing, the kernels are sets on both sides. They are sets of vectors. They are not individual vectors. And if you want to show two sets are equal, you have to show that something in one set is in the other, and something in the other set is also in the first. So here is the task. We need to do two things. Thing number one is we need to show if V is in the kernel of A, then V is in the kernel of A transpose A. Why is it so? That's the easy direction. What does it mean for V to be in the kernel of A? Well, it means it means A V equals zero. That's the definition of the kernel. In fact, it's the zero vector. 
And so if you hit both sides with A transpose, A transpose 0 is 0. So A transpose A V is also 0. It doesn't matter whether it's transpose or B or whatever. It doesn't matter. So V is in the kernel of A transpose 0. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. So V is in the kernel of A transpose A. And this actually proves, in particular, that the kernel of A is a subset of the kernel of, a, of B A for any B. That, that's a useful fact. Anything in the kernel of A is also in the kernel of B A. It looks a bit weird, but remember, if it's in here, then A V equals 0, so also B A V equals 0. So anything in the kernel of A is in the kernel of BA. That's for any B. It doesn't work the other way around. It's not true that the kernel of BA is inside the kernel of A in general. But it is when B is the special matrix A transpose. So, so far we haven't used anything about A transpose. So the harder direction is this. If V is in the kernel of A transpose A, then V is supposed to be in the kernel of A. That's what we want to prove. All right, so here's where I think it's probably not necessary that you are going to have to do this. So if V is in the kernel of A transpose A, then A transpose A, well, if V is in the kernel A transpose A, then a transpose A V equals 0. Now, we had a fact, and I want to be sure I state it in the fact, in the way that it, we learnt it, as opposed to the way that would be more convenient for this problem that I happen to know. So let me try to look it up from section 5.3, 4. So, All right, we had learnt this. And this is a separate fact that you may feel like one should prove. But I did actually prove this in the original thing. We had this fact. The kernel of A transpose is equal to the image of A perp. We spent a lot of time on that, in fact, in the original reviews. And I even sort of went over this last week, which seems like a month ago, but in the very first of the re uh, reading period review sessions, I, I proved that, actually. So here's the deal. If this is true, AV is in the kernel of A transpose. Right? Because A transpose AV equals 0. So we start with V being in the kernel of A transpose A, and we are forced to conclude that AV is in the kernel of A transpose. But this is equal to the perpendicular of the image of A. OK, so what? Well, this means that AV, whatever it is, is perpendicular to the image of A. If you believe this fact, then you're first forced to conclude that AV is perpendicular to the image of A. But AV is in the image of A. So what is a vector that is not only in a subspace? Sorry? Why is AV in the image of A? Because A of, no, no, because A anything is in the image of A by definition. No. Even if V is in the kernel, AV would be then 0, which is still in the image of A. OK, if there's one thing I can tell you, you know for sure. It's AV is in the image of A. Because the image of A consists of all vectors that you can write as AV for some V. So AV is in the image of A. A anything is in the image of A. You don't need to know anything about A or the something. A blah is in the image of A. But in this particular case, it's also perpendicular to the image of A. So what's a vector in a subspace which is perpendicular to the subspace? Zero, that's it. So this says that AV equals zero. So V is in the kernel of A. That's the proof. 
Again, I think the chances of you needing to produce that are, are pretty darn small, but asked and answered. Do you have a question about this? No, no, it's not true that the kernel of A is a subset of the kernel of AB. For one thing, it may not even make sense dimensionally because the, if it, it depends on the dimensions of the matrices. So for example, for if B is say M by P and A, no, you want it the other way around. Suppose that A is m by p and b is p by n then a would be i'm sorry ab would be m by n so the kernel of a would be p dimensional and the kernel of ab would be n dimensional when i say dimensional i mean the vector would be a p vector and the kernel of AB would be an n vector. But you see, at least the kernel of B and the kernel of AB would both be consist of n vectors. So your question as to whether this would be true for AB, I mean, they may not even be subsets of the same space. And it's not true even if they are in general. Okay? So, I mean, if you want to ask questions about this, that's fine. But as I said, I don't think it's likely. What, Yeah, of course. It's so all true, true that if you take perps of both sides, you, this is true. The image of A, to find the image of A, you could, in fact, take A transpose, find its kernel, and take its orthogonal complement. And that, that's true. You just take perps of both sides of the top equation. But that was not what, that's not as useful in this problem. It's sort of weird, isn't it? The image of A is the perpendicular subspace to the kernel of A transpose. Do you have a question about this? Are you next? Who is next? Three? Who is four? You are four. Did five go? You are five. Didn't you already ask a question? Oh, well, then you're not five. You're five. Except we're already up to three, so it's not as bad as it sounds. <coughs> three, four, five. When is it time to take a break? What is it? 8.53. Okay. Uh, how about we take a break after 3, and then we'll remember to do 4 and 5. Okay? And during the break, I have an evaluation that I'd like you to fill out. It's sort of not a full sample, because the... Well, there are plenty of people who are here on Tuesday, but... Hopefully it's a fair and representative one. All right, three. What question would you like to ask? Spring 2006. Number five. Show that AB equals BA, that sort of thing. So it says, suppose A and B have the same eigenbasis, V1 through Vn. Show that AB equals BA. OK. So there's a couple of concepts going on. The first thing I'd like to say is let's just see what A does to VI. What's A V1? It's an eigenvector of A. So we don't know what the eigenvalue is. We've got to call it something. So let's call it lambda 1. 
and we'll continue and so forth. Now, the same vectors are also eigenvalues, the eigenvectors rather, of B, but the eigenvalues may be different. We're not told anything about the eigenvalues. So we better use a different letter. So BV1 I'm going to call mu1 V1. And so on up to BVN equals mu n Vn. All right. Well, we're interested in A, B, and B, A. And we know a lot about A and B evaluated at these vectors V. So let's just look at V1. What is A, B, V1? B, V1 is mu1, V1. And mu1 is just a scalar, so we can pull it out the front. And we get mu1, A, V1. But A, V1 is lambda1, V1. So this is equal to mu1, lambda1, V1. And there's nothing special about 1. We'll do the same for all of them. And similarly, A, B, V, N in gory detail is A mu n V n, which is mu n lambda n V n. Now, if instead you compute B A V 1, you find this is B times lambda 1 V 1, which is lambda 1 V V 1, which is lambda 1 mu 1 V 1 and so on, and you'll find B A V N is lambda N mu N V N. And the important thing is that although the eigenvalues are multiplied in a different order, it's still a product of two real numbers and they commute. So U1 V1, this is equal to this. So we've shown that A B V1 equals B A V1 and so on, all the way up to A B V N equals B A V N. So does that show that A B commute? Almost. Almost obvious. But now you have to do an argument. And so the argument written down is that since V1 up to V N are a basis of R N, that proves the result. But just to be really, really precise, suppose you have an arbitrary vector. Now, if X is any vector in R N, so here's the full details, which are not necessary, but I might as well show you. If x is in Rn, then x is equal to some c1 v1 plus c2 v2 and so on up to cn vn. OK, so that's because the v1 up to vn form a basis. So it's true that abx is equal to c1 abv1 plus C2, A, B, V2, and so on, up to Cn, A, B, V, N. See, A, B is just a linear transformation, and it acts on the individual vectors with the coefficients coming out and the pluses preserved. That's the definition of linear transformation. And now, of course, we know individually for these vectors, A, B, 1 equals, uh, A, B, V, 1 is equal to B, A, V, 1 and so on up to Cn, Ba, Vn. And now you reverse it, you pull out Ba, and you get Ba, X. So knowing it for V1 up to Vn gives it to you for all X. And we know A, B, X equals Ba, X for all X, which means that A, B equals Ba. A question. Yes, this is, this is a very nice, this is probably, probably leads to a, a very nice solution. So let's see if we can make it work. So we know that A and B are diagonalizable. So this means that A is equal to S, D, S inverse, where D is lambda 1 up to lambda n. So this is an alternative solution. 
B, unfortunately, well, okay, so B, here's the real task. You cannot, in general, use the same S. How many text messages are you getting? Okay. Okay. However, yes, you're quite correct. S is the matrix of eigenvalue of eigenvectors. And this is the same for both of them. So yes, B can be written as S, say, E S inverse, where E is mu1 up to mu n. Yeah, but it, they can actually be the same vectors because we're told v1 up to vn are all eigenvalue, eigenvectors of A and of B. That's right. Multiplying the eigenvector by something doesn't change the eigenvalue. The eigenvalue is the same. So the S matrix, this is the key observation. Yes, the A S matrix is the same. And so now if you compute AB, you get S, D, E, S inverse because the S's in the middle will cancel. Look, let me do it explicitly and you'll You get S, D, S inverse, S, E, S inverse. And that is S, D, E, S inverse. And then B, A, by the same token, is S, E, D, S inverse. And then the other question is, is D, E equal to E, D? And you can easily see that any two diagonal matrices commute because you just multiply the individual diagonals. So any two diagonal matrices commute. What does the commute mean? Commute means that AB equals BA. They, they, it doesn't matter which order you multiply them. Any two diagonal matrices commute. And the, the proof is just that the product is the product of the elements. It's this. It's exactly this. Lambda 1, mu 1. Lambda 2, mu 2. <laughs> number 4 is now promoted to number 1. It was you, right? No? Yes. Go ahead. Number nine. Number nine. Oh, the true false questions. The true false questions. All of them? Yes. Okay, so the question is can I do them? Or would you like me to do them? Okay. Spring 06, question 9, all. So the first part says that any skew symmetric matrix and we recall that that means A transpose is minus A with N odd has 0 as its only real eigenvector a real eigenvalue. All right, so I have to tell you the solution is very much patterned after the solution in the book, which shows that if you have any eigenvalue of a symmetric matrix, it must be real. And so, unfortunately, there's nothing we can really do other than say, OK, let's suppose we have a complex eigenvalue of A. So let's su suppose lambda is complex with eigenvector v plus iw. What we want to show is that the real part of lambda must be 0. OK, that, that's going to be the idea. And so the way I'm thinking about it is this. A symmetric matrix has eigenvalues which are all real. What we're going to prove is that a skew symmetric matrix has eigenvalues which are all pure imaginary. OK, so we didn't know that. We didn't learn this as a fact. But now I'm going to prove this. OK. So what does this mean? Well. I'm just following along the solution here. How you would think about it would be, tr it's not so easy to come up with. Again, it's following the book here. But 
There's a general principle that if you have a symmetric matrix or a skew symmetric matrix, well, for a symmetric matrix, what you want to do is this, V dot AV. You may or may not have seen that before. For a skew symmetric matrix, it turns out, and you only know this by actually finding out the hard way, that maybe you want to consider the conjugate of the vector here and the regular vector here. So I'm just following along and explaining the solution. How to think of it is to follow the argument in the textbook. So I, th I think it's a little bit of a trick in a way. But they ask you to play along with this. It says, OK, you have v minus iw dot a v plus iw. It says, just consider that quantity. Now, part of the reason is that this is also an eigenvector for A as well. We've seen that if V plus IW is, then V minus IW is an eigenvector as well. So, so right, right. Right. Why well, there's a number of reasons, but essentially, In general, v dot a w is a transpose v dot w. OK, but if a happens to equal a transpose, then v dot a w equals a v dot w. And so you can often get a lot of mileage out of that for a symmetric matrix. It's just a lot of the proofs turn out to, to work like that. Now, in this case, let's just see where we go with this. If you look at this, you get v minus i w. A V plus I W is lambda V plus I W because we've assumed lambda is an eigen uh, is an eigen value of A with and this is the eigenvector and now the result the reason for using the conjugate here might be clear if you expand this out you get V dot V plus W dot W minus i w dot v plus i w dot v. In the imaginary part cancels out because these are conjugates. And you simply get lambda times v dot v, which is the norm of v squared, plus the norm of w squared. OK, so that's their first, that's their first sort of equation. Now, they say taking the complex conjugate, but maybe the clearer thing to do is to start again this is just the complex conjugate of this. But if you start again with v plus, I w, uh, v plus i w dot a v minus i w, the idea here is that this okay, will pull the a over to this side as an a transpose. And again, that's exactly what I've said here. If a is on one vector. A transpose is always able to be pulled to the other vector. So if I pull this over, I get A transpose V plus IW dot V minus IW. And A transpose is minus A. And then again, this is now minus lambda v plus i w dot v minus i w, which is minus lambda times absolute value of v squared plus absolute value of w squared. And the solution, by the way, somehow neglects to put these lengths in there. That just says v squared plus w squared. OK, now look at this equation and compare it to this equation. This is the complex conjugate. So let, let's say what we've got here. We've got v minus i w dot a v plus i w is equal to lambda outside of v squared plus w squared. And we found that v plus i w dot a v minus i w 
equals minus lambda times the same quantity. If you took the complex conjugate of everything here, then V minus IW becomes V plus IW. A is the same, and V plus IW becomes V minus IW. And on the other hand, the right-hand side is real. So the complex conjugate of this, says V plus IW dot a v minus i w is equal to lambda v squared plus w squared. All right, so this same quantity here equals the negative of the two things. So this thing must be 0. So lambda v squared plus w squared equals 0. No, that's not true. The conjugate has this in it. I apologize. Let's just go back again. I'm, I'm being a little careless here. I wrote down the two equations that we actually computed by blood, sweat, and tears. I took the conjugate of the first one, and I get v plus iw dot a v minus iw, which is the same as the left-hand side here. And I get the conjugate of lambda times this real quantity. So I say the conjugate of lambda times this real quantity here is equal to minus lambda times the same quantity. There we go. That's the equation. And so if v and w are both 0, then v plus iw cannot be an eigenvector. So this is non-zero, and we can divide by it. And so this proves that lambda bar equals minus lambda, where this is the complex conjugate. And the only way that can happen is if lambda is real, as in lambda plus lambda bar, which is 2 times the real of lambda, lambda, is 0. I said lambda is real. I mean pure imaginary. The only way this can happen is if lambda is pure imaginary. So lambda is equal to I say y for some y. In particular, if lambda equals is real, lambda must equal 0. OK, that's really cruel. And I don't know how you could come up with it other than let me make the following observation. If A is symmetric, what is the difference? If A is symmetric instead of skew symmetric, the only difference is you don't have this minus sign here. And you also, therefore, do not have the minus sign here. And so for the symmetric case, you would end up with lambda bar equals lambda, which means lambda is real. And that is exactly the, book, the proof the book gives that if A is symmetric, then lambda is real. It does exactly this, except instead of having a minus here, which comes from the skew symmetry, it has a plus plus. And so what this question is expecting you to do is, I'm afraid, know how the proof goes of this in the book and adapt it to the skew symmetric case. I don't think it's very fair, but there you go. Now, we haven't even finished. We have not even finished. We still have to show that lambda equals 0 is an eigenvalue. But this is true. It's true for any odd matrix, odd dimensional matrix. If A is n by n with n odd, A has at least one real eigenvalue. A has at least one real eigenvalue, because its characteristic polynomial being of odd degree has a root. Therefore, it must be 0. since we've shown that the only real eigenvalues are 0. So not only must the only real eigenvalue be 0, but it must actually be an eigenvalue. If A it happens to be an even dimension matrix, like 2 by 2, skew symmetric, it doesn't even have to have any eigenvalues.
such as this matrix. No real eigenvalues at all. OK? So I don't know how satisfactory that is, whether you would think of it, but that's my solution. Uh, well, that's how the official solution goes. OK, so you asked the question, I mean, all I can offer is, does it make sense, not how would you think of it, because the way you're supposed to think of it is to know the proof in the book. OK, and it's an involved proof. It involves looking at two different quantities which happen to be the conjugate of each other, neither of which seems to be particularly intuitive. So, sorry, I can't offer any further explanation. I can, however, do part B. Any other questions about that? Or are you just going to throw up your hands and say, oh, well? You have a question about that? Or? OK, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the, the, pr the proof says, OK, let's just take any old complex eigenvalue, and let's take any old complex eigenvector that goes with that eigenvalue. OK, now see what we can do with it. You're basically just doing something that works. And you know that it works because it's in the book. Yeah. Well, lambda plus lambda bar is always twice the real part of lambda. It's, it's like p plus iq plus p minus iq, so it's 2p. And we know that lambda bar plus lambda is 0. In the case of symmetric, lambda bar equals lambda, which means p plus iq equals p minus iq, so the q part is zero. So it's purely real. OK, so. All right, well, I'd better do part b. Yeah, I mean, that question's sort of unlucky. I'd imagine just a couple of people really gave a convincing explanation. I myself, believe it or not, tried it and came up with a proof that I thought was right but was wrong. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> That anything is possible. Well, <laughs> the question is how much complex stuff are you supposed to know? Well, I mean, you're supposed to know, all you had to know is complex conjugates, and that's it. You know, I mean, so you're supposed to know complex conjugates and how to multiply by i. You didn't even need any modulus or argument or any sort of. You didn't need to solve z to the n equals w, but that, it's, it's certainly all contained in Math 104, everything you need to know about complex numbers. <laughs> yes, Math 104. All right, part b. Moving on, part b. It says, let a be m by p, and let b be p by n. Part a, part i. If a, b is 0, then the rank of A plus rank of B is less than or equal to P. And I guess true or false is the question. OK, so let's see what we get. If A, B equals 0, it may be, whenever you look at ranks, it may be useful to consider images. After all, ranks are dimensions of images, right? You've asked me the question. That's why I'm looking at you and saying, right. OK, so what can you tell me about the image of B per, per se? Well, it has dimension rank of, of B. But if a vector is in the image of B, what can you say about A times that vector? So if V, well, if, say if V is in the image of B, what can you tell me about AV? What can anyone tell me about AV? Excuse me. Uh, OK, V is in the kernel, meaning AV equals 0. Let Here's why. If V is in the image of B, V is equal to BW. So AV uh, for some W. That's what it means to be in the image. It equals B of something. So AV equals ABW. But that's 0 because AB is 0. 
So in other words, the image of B is entirely contained in the kernel of A. Okay, that's sort of a critical assumption. So what does that tell you about the rank of B? That puts a mission here. It's less than or equal to the dimension of the kernel of A. I mean, if one subspace is inside another, its dimension is less. What's the dimension of the kernel of A? That's the nullity of A. OK, so the key to this question is A, B equals 0. The image of B is inside the kernel of A. So the rank of B is less than or equal to the nullity of A. Now, what does the rank nullity theorem say? What's the nullity of A? It's, it's P minus, it's, so it's the number of columns. So we, we know in particular rank of A plus the nullity of A equals P. That's the rank nullity theorem. So this is equal to P minus the rank of A. And so if you add rank A to both sides, you get rank A plus rank B is less than or equal to P, which is exactly what we're trying to prove. So my solution there is a little bit different from the official. I don't know. The nullity of a matrix which is all zeros? Yeah, is it n? It's, the, it's, the, it's n. It's the number of columns. Because okay. the rank is 0. So, the, okay, vector 0, it doesn't count as anything. Yeah, every vector in the domain, which is n dimensional, is in the kernel, of course, because A is the 0 matrix. OK? Any questions about that solution? It is a little different from the original. Okay, so next. It says if the rank, and, and this is still within the context of A being M by P and B being P by N. So the question is if the rank of B and the rank of, the language is really awful. If the rank of B and the rank of AB should be R both maximal, And we're no longer assuming, obviously, that AB equals 0, or else this is just the rank of the 0 matrix, which is 0. Then the rank of A is maximal. Well, I don't like the question very much, because it's not clear what maximal means. So the only way I can interpret it is we know that the maximum rank of a matrix is the minimum of the two dimensions. So in other words, here's my interpretation. What it's saying is, look, we're assuming that rank B is equals the minimum of, and B is P by N, P and N, because this is the maximum the rank can be. Whatever's the smaller, maybe I won't say minimum, I'll say the smaller of the two. And rank AB is the smaller of M and N because AB is M by N. And then you're supposed to say. of M and P. That's, what, that's, the only thing I, that's the only sense I can make out of the question, since maximal is just as big as it possibly could be. So you don't even like that. Well, OK. You, you, the question is, if it's maximal, why am I using the word smaller? 
So it's like this. If you have an a M, M by N matrix, so here's the fact I'm using. If A is M by N, or A is M by P, then the rank A is less than or equal to M and P. So if I give you a 3 by 7 matrix, what's the biggest possible rank it could have? 3. Or a 7 by 3 matrix, the biggest it could be is 3. So the maximal is sort of the smaller of the two. But in any case, the thing is not even true. And the example they give, again, how to think of it, I don't really know. I'm just going with the solution for the moment. Then we can discuss how you might have thought of it. If you let A be this, then the rank is 2. And the rank is 2 because if you do the elimination, you'll get 0, 0, 0 in this, in this row. So rank A is 2, which is certainly not maximal. 3 would be maximal for a 3 by 3 matrix. On the other hand, B is 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. OK, well, even without the, the third column, these are still sort of pivot one, so the rank of B is 2, which is certainly maximal. You cannot have a rank bigger than 2 in a 3 by 2 matrix. If you, if you can A to B, you get 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, which also has a rank of 2. In fact, it's the same as this matrix here. So the question is, how did they think of it? Well, notice that the top part of B is the identity, which is why AB is the same as the second two columns of A. And so it's this third column that prevents the rank from being 3. And they've managed to do it in such a way that the 1-1s one in B, which are not particularly necessary in some sense, when you put them over here and multiply it, they go away. And yet, that 1 is responsible for those 1s there. So I, I think it's sort of a trial and error type of method that they had. But I bet you you can find a smaller dimensional one. You ought to be able to find a simpler one. I, I didn't actually think of this. But I wonder if I can come up with an even smaller case, a 2 by 2 matrix and uh, a 2 by 1 matrix. So is it possible that A is equal to a 2 by 2 matrix, B is a 2 by 1 matrix, so I'm just going to fill these in here, and therefore AB is equal to also a 2 by 1 matrix. I wouldn't be surprised if it's possible. But I don't know exactly what it should be. It's going to have to be something like this. I'm not sure about that one yet. Yeah, sure. Doesn't that work? If you take A, B, you get 1, 1. Just multiply it out. So the rank of this is 1, which is as large as it can possibly be. The rank of this is also 1. And the rank of this is 1, which is less than it needs to be. OK, so that's my solution. It's a little bit more intuitive there. So the, the trick is to essentially make A bigger than it needs to be with a 0 column. I, yeah, I, I find that now I, n I now declare the official solution a little unintuitive. But it's, it's the, the intuition is that that third column of A, which you don't really need um, in general, is, is the key to making the rank of A not big enough. OK? All the rest of the stuff is just, I don't know, it's just confusing. This is my example. All right. That's a pretty hard set of true-false questions. What can I say?
All right, so who was number five now of two? Okay, yes. Spring of 2007, number seven. Spring of 2007, number seven. Oh, no, it's fall. So it's January. January. So it's spring, of, uh, fall of 2006. January 26, 2007. Okay, I, I'm going to call out 406. And it's question seven that you want, which is the plane curve described by the equation. So we're, okay. Great. Great. Oh no. Actually, I knew an, another Israeli who would just say that word that way all the time. So. All right. Uh, consider the plane curve described by the equation 3x squared plus 2axy plus 12y squared equals 1. Okay, so we're in quadratic form territory. And it says, for which values of this parameter a is the curve an ellipse, and for which is it a hyperbola? So... For which a, a is this an ellipse, and which a is it a hyperbola? All right. So first of all, let q of x be this quadratic form. And this is equal to x, y, a, x, y. Maybe I'll write it like this. x, y transpose a, x, y, where a is the matrix. 3, 12, and then a, a. Because I've got this handy 2 here, 2 a, x. All right? So I have half in one and half in the other. So I just need to consider what are the eigenvalues of a. Well, let's just work them out. You can do this by trace type of considerations. But I think the thing you'd probably be most likely to whack out would be this. So what does this work out to be? It's 3 minus lambda, 12 minus lambda, minus a squared, which is lambda squared minus 15 lambda plus 36 minus a squared. Why do I get, why did I get something else when I did this myself? I think I made a mistake. Well, I don't, th I don't think I made a mistake now. But I think I made a mistake when I worked this out earlier on my own. So, okay. So, anyway. Uh, when are you going to get an ellipse and when are you going to get a hyperbola? What, what, is, what is the thing we're looking for? Right, so what we are interested in knowing is the sign of the eigenvalue. If one of them is positive and the other one is negative, what do you get? A hyperbola when you graph q of x equals 1. What about if they're both positive? What do you get? An ellipse. What if they're both negative? <coughs> Sorry? Well, it's possible, but the graph is pretty boring. If both eigenvalues are negative, the graph of qx, q of x, y equals 1 is empty. There's no graph at all. So what we're asking is then when are the eigenvalues are both negative or both positive. All right. So you have to analyze this quadratic equation and say, oh, for what values of A is one solution positive and one solution negative? So maybe that is, I mean, it's not so hard to do by writing down the solutions, but maybe we should have done something else in the first place. 
And that is this. Instead, let the eigenvalues be this. What do we know about lambda 1 and lambda 2 just by looking at the 2 by 2 matrix A? What's lambda 1 plus lambda 2? It's 15. So we know lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is 15. And what's the product lambda 1 times lambda 2? It's the determinant, which is 36 minus A squared. OK, so that comes directly out of here. And so what we're sort of asking is, what is the value of A that makes one of them positive and one of them negative? Well, actually, you only really need to look at this. Because the product of two numbers is equal to a negative number if one of them is negative and a positive number if they're both positive. So basically, what it comes down to then is this. If 36 minus a squared is greater than 0, then lambda 1, lambda 2 is greater than 0. And if 36 minus a squared is less than 0, then lambda 1, lambda 2 is less than 0. And in this case, we definitely get a hyperbola. The only thing to convince yourself is that if the product is positive, then they can't both be negative. Why can't they both be negative? Because they sum to 15. So in this case, both lambda, both positive, ellipse. OK, here is the fact. If a matrix is diagonalizable, with real diagonalizable, then the trace is the sum of the real eigenvalues. In particular, a symmetric matrix is real diagonalizable, so the trace of a symmetric matrix is the sum of the real eigenvalues, which are the only eigenvalues. In general, a diagonalizable matrix with complex eigenvalues the trace is, again, the sum of the complex eigenvalues. But not the real ones only. If there are complex eigenvalues, you need to include them. And when I say the sum of, you always have to include the algebraic multiplicities of the eigenvalues. A matrix which is not diagonalizable, it's just not true. There aren't enough eigenvalues to make it true. But it is if you consider algebraic multiplicities of the, of the things, essentially. <coughs> Uh, yes, again, if, if all the things I said apply to determinants and products as well. Okay? All right, now, so I didn't, I didn't write this down very well, but I kind of wanted to say, well, look, lambda 1, lambda 2 less than 0, this is a hyperbola. Obviously, one is positive, one is negative. In this case, I wanted to just say that they can't both be negative because the trace is 15. So, not both negative. We're okay. All right, so the end of we just have to say it's an ellipse if, if a squared is less than 36, i.e., a is between minus 6 and 6. And it's a hyperbola if a is greater than 6 or a is less than minus 6. What if a equals 6? then one of the eigenvalues is 0. What does that do? It's not going to, it's going to screw up the graph. See, instead of having something like this, the graph would normally look like this. Lambda 1, uh, say C1 squared plus lambda 2, C2 squared equals 1. With respect to these eigenvectors, wherever they are. So it'll be a rotated version of this. If one of these is 0, you just get lambda 1 c1 squared is 1, say, which looks like this. It means the c1 coordinate is plus or minus 1 over root lambda 1. So this is just a pair of lines in the c1 direction. Why equals uh, 36, 1, 0? Because it's a 
Sorry, what's the question? Okay, if a squared equals 36, then you have lambda 1, lambda 2 is 36. It is 0, rather, because a squared equals 36, which means one of the eigenvalues is 0. The other one has to be 15. So they're not both 0. It's not the 0 matrix. Okay, so then with respect to the coordinates C1 and C2 after you do the diagonalization, you get lambda 1 C1 squared equals 1, which means that you get a pair of vertical lines. How do you get another one C1? Well, because lambda 2 is 0. Yeah, in fact, lambda 1 has to be 15. So the pair of vertical lines is at, is at plus or minus, well, plus here 1 over root 15 minus 1 over root 15. Except it will be rotated depending on where the eigenvectors are in that case. Now, what I want to say is you can think of those vertical lines as a sort of limiting hyperbola or ellipse. Okay? If, it, if you think of it as a hyperbola that goes whoop, 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 the evolution of the hyperbola is that they just get flatter and flatter until you get the parallel lines. Or you can think of it as an ellipse gone berserk. Stretched and stretched and stretched and stretched until it's parallel line. So it's the limiting case of that. A bunch of questions from this. <coughs> so the question is, are all quadratic forms diagonalizable? Yes, they all look like symmetric matrices if you write them down correctly, and therefore they are. Yep, another question. So you take this one, which of course encodes this information anyway in it. If you use the quadratic formula. Yep. So wouldn't that mean that um, a squared has to be greater than 144 for it to be, um, for, for it to be, uh, for it to only be squared? So I have it on good authority, then, that if you do try it using the quadratic formula, you'll get a satisfactory result. But I think it's better to use this sort of product thing, because it immediately tells you. And it's in the textbook that says, you know, for a 2 by 2 quadratic form, um, just look at the determinant. It will tell you whether the product of the eigenvalues is positive or negative. I just wanted you to be aware, it doesn't really say it in the book so much, that if the product is 0, you get neither a hyperbola nor an ellipse. You get these two parallel lines. It's, it's sort of weird. All right, so that was 7 part A. Do we want to do 7 part B and C as well? You asked the question. Do you want to see them too? You do. Why am I not surprised? Everyone always wants to see all parts of every question. So far, that has been true of all the questions. All right, let's see what we have. The question is, is it true that there's a 3 by 3 matrix for which the span of the row vectors contains 1, 1, 1, and whose null space contains 1, minus 1, 1. So we're looking for a 3 by 3 matrix. Well, that's the kernel. Such that span of row vectors contains 1, 1, 1, but null space, i.e. kernel, contains 1, minus 1, 1. Is there such a thing? That's the question. OK? So the row space is the span of the row vectors, if you think of them as vectors. But one thing I said the other day is that the row space of A is essentially equal to the image of A transpose. It's the column space of A transpose. So the question is, can you have, i.e., can you have 1, 1, 1 in the image of A transpose and 1, 1, 1, 1 in the kernel of A. Well, the 
this would mean A transpose V equals 1, 1, 1 for some V. And yet A of 1 minus 1, 1 equals 0. All right, so is that possible? Could you have A transpose V equals 1, 1, 1? And yet A of 1 minus 1, 1 is 0. Well, what hope is there? Let's call this W. OK, so suppose we look at W dot A transpose V. This is equal to a w dot v. Remember, the transpose can be pulled up to the other side. But a w is zero. It's true. This is true for any matrix A. W dot A transpose V is a w dot V. It's just always true. The transpose goes from one to the other and loses its transpose. But AW is 0. So this means that W, which is after all 1 minus 1, 1, dot A transpose V, which is 1, 1, 1, equals 0. That's just not true. So the answer is false. Now, I that may not seem very intuitive to you. So let me describe it another way. So. Let's write A like this, V1, V2, V3. I'm writing them as columns. And we're given that 1 minus 1, 1 is in the kernel of A. So this 1 minus 1, 1 equals the vector 0, 0, 0. That's because this is in the kernel of A. OK? So what this means is, call this vector W again. This means V1 dot W equals V2 dot W equals V3 dot W equals 0. So each of the rows is perpendicular to that magic vector 1 minus 1, 1. OK? That's what it means to be in the kernel. A vector is in the kernel of a matrix if it's actually perpendicular to each of the rows, the row vectors. Just multiply it out and you'll see. You get v1 dot, this is v1 dot w1, or w. This is v2 dot w, this is v3 dot w. So if w is in the kernel of a matrix, it's perpendicular to all the rows. And in particular, it's perpendicular to the span of the rows. So c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus c3 v3 dot w equals 0. In other words, w is perpendicular to the row space. So i.e. w is perpendicular to the row space. This is true for any w in the kernel. And this is exactly the statement that the image of A transpose, or the image of A perp is the kernel of A transpose. I think this is just another way of writing the whole thing. Anyway, W is perpendicular to the row space. So W is supposed to be 1 minus 1, 1. And the row space is supposed to include 1, 1, 1. But this vector isn't even perpendicular to this vector, so it's impossible. OK, that's a, a less technical way of, of doing it. However you want to see it, these are all different ways of writing the same thing. OK, so I, I gave sort of two methods, although they're really the same method. They're just written. OK, so you may want to stare at it, but are there any questions about that part at this point? OK, so probably the, the second method is the more intuitive, but less snazzy. But basically, if you just learn that the intuition or try to describe that the kernel is perpendicular to the row space, then you're fine. OK, and then 
the, the last part, part C, is it true that there exists A, which is 3 by 3? Let's say that both 1 minus 1 and 2, uh, 2 and 1, 1 minus 1 are both, in, so are both in kernel of A. And 2, 0, 1 is not in kernel of A. And this one, hopefully, is much easier than the others. It's like a little comic relief at the end of this onslaught. I mean, OK, admittedly, you have to look at it a little bit. But I mean, if you just add these two vectors up, you get this one. So call this x and y. So this says that x is in kernel of A, y is in kernel of A, but x plus y is not in kernel of A? No, impossible, since kernel of A is a subspace. If x is in a subspace and y is in the same subspace, then so is x plus y. OK, so there does require, do you require plotting that this vector here is a linear combination of these two. That's what it comes down to. So this one was particularly easy to see that it was the sum of it. In general, how would you see whether this was a linear combination of the other two? So one way of doing it is try to express it as a linear combination, which is to look at 1 minus 2, 2, 1, 1 minus 1 and see if you can solve that system. If that has a solution, that's, then, then the answer is yes, it is a linear combination. As it happens, the solution is 1, 1. Okay? But actually, another way of doing it is just to see if that determinant is 0 or not. If that determinant is 0, then the columns are linearly dependent. And therefore, this one is able to be written as the other. So you could just look at the determinant of that 3 by 3 matrix and see if it works. Of course, if these were actually not 3 vectors but were 4 dimensional vectors, there would be no determinant because there would only be 3 columns. But it happens to work right now for this case. In any case, it should be easy enough to spot that that's just the sum. All right. Thank you very much to the videographer, Robert, and to all of you for watching. Yes. <laughs>